Hello and welcome. You're watching Beyond. This show is called Gravitas and I am Archer Vora. We've got lots lined up for you over the next 60 minutes. Lots that's happening in our uh, neighboring country, Pakistan. Uh, but first, the headlines. Pakistani politicians say economic corridor with China will help India. A reflection of Pakistan's China concerns? Pakistan also claimed India sent submarines to its waters. India denied. Currency crisis derails Indian parliament for the third straight day. The government warns against misuse of accounts for converting black money. Beyond reports on use of plastic money as cues for paper continue. COP22 began in Marrakesh in Morocco. How will Donald Trump's denial of global warming impact the ongoing debate on climate change? Will Trump undo Obama's doing? Automaker Volkswagen decides to cut 30,000 jobs, 23,000 of them in Germany alone, to cut costs. And believe it or not, the dress Marlon Munro wore when she sang Happy Birthday President for President Kennedy has gone for a world record $4.8 million. But first up, a group of American scientists have identified 10 sites where they say Pakistan's nuclear weapons are located. The scientists have used commercially available satellite imagery to identify at least five bases. These include army garrisons in Gujranwala in Punjab, then again in Sindh, in Khuzdar in Baluchistan, with a possible sixth in Bhawalpur. There are air bases with F-16s uh, and Mirage fighters especially configured for carrying nuclear ordnance. The report estimates the size of Pakistan's nuclear arsenal at around 140 nuclear warheads and more that Pakistan continues to build. Hans Christensen is now joining us and this is an exclusive interview of him with Vion. Thanks very much, sir, for speaking to Vion tonight. Thank you. Let me start by asking you, your nuclear notebook on Pakistani nuclear forces has compiled new evidence on Pakistan's nuclear forces. What is this evidence based upon? Well, it's a long history of um, digging up various sources of information about um, how Pakistan um, is uh, developing its nuclear arsenal, where is it going, uh, what is the posture looking like. And so over the several years, we've, we've looked at satellite photos and try to monitor where these things would appear. We, of course, have also talked to people in the intelligence communities about what it looks like, and we've observed what other people have been seeing um, using public sources. And so this is our annual update of this, and this year we decided to include uh, a number of these uh, satellite photos. Uh, Hans, could you throw some light on what are the new, what are the revelations as far as uh, this report is concerned? Because you admit that uh, uh, some of this information was already available in uh, the public domain. Some of the revelations that surprised you when you and your co-author Robert Norris compiled this report. Well, I think what we're seeing now is that um, a lot of the efforts that Pakistan uh, had over the last decade are sort of beginning to show up um, in a more um, focused posture, if you will, uh, involving nuclear capable forces as well. Um, we haven't had a good picture of where they went uh, for a long time, um, but now we're getting more of the, of the infrastructure, of the texture of it. Um, there will be more to come. Um, this is uh, only the beginning, and uh, some of these will be you know, looked at and maybe discredited. Others will be found and, and so forth. This is an ongoing public debate about what the status is. Hans, uh, your findings on uh, uh, Pakistan's F-16s and Mirages, uh, I have to say, are startling. The F-16s were sold by the United States to Pakistan, and if I remember correctly, the condition was that they could not be used to deliver nuclear weapons. And uh, the report that you filed very clearly states that that indeed isn't the case. Uh, to quote, uh, uh, you quote sources that indicate that some of these planes have nonetheless been nuclear-enabled. Can the supplier in this case, the United States, initiate any form of action? They can, but they won't. Um, I mean, you know, this, they made their point, they made their case, and, and what Pakistan does when they get the planes is obviously inevitably up to them. 
So I don't think this is going to be an issue that's going to be, you know, some contention between the United States and Pakistan. Now, this has been known for quite some time. Uh, in fact, the F-16s were the first airplanes that were considered to be nuclear capable in the Pakistani ar uh, arsenal. And later, the, uh, the, the Mirage has been upgraded uh, as well, and it will be now a carrier of the uh, new air launch uh, cruise missile, the RAD. Uh, but Hans, do you think that uh, your report would be used by the Congress in uh, at least uh, uh, telling the government in the United States, we know that the, the transition is on and soon there will be a new government, to ensure that America stopped selling more F-16s? That is a decision that Congress has recently taken. Uh, but in future as well, to not give more uh, uh, as far as military equipment is concerned to Pakistan? Um, we'll see. It's hard to predict because, uh, uh, you know, political moods change and, and, and the strategic situation on the ground also changes. So a lot of it depends on, on how well uh, the United States cooperates with Pakistan on the war on terror. And, and that can influence, of course, what the United States will do or not do. Um, but right now, I think um, the United States is more concerned about the Pakistani development of short-range tactical nuclear weapons, um, some of the which we identify at several of the bases. Those are not strategic threats to India, if you will, because they have very short range. They're developed to um, counter um, Indian conventional invasion of Pakistan. You know, whether that happens or not hmm. remains to be seen. But there's real American concern about that portion of the arsenal because of their dispersal uh, in a crisis, uh, et cetera, and that they could be used earlier on in a conflict than nuclear weapons otherwise would be. That is uh, indeed an important uh, point that you have highlighted, Hans. I'd like to again ask you, when you talk about war on terror, what about war for terror? If this report is now available and some of it has already been in the public domain, by which I mean the sites of uh, uh, the sites where uh, Pakistan is uh, keeping its nuclear arsenal, wouldn't you say that perhaps some of these non-state actors, as, as Pakistan calls them, some of the terror groups perhaps have this information as well? Well, they've already had access to this if they wanted it. Um, but the point is that the security of nuclear bases is not dependent on whether you know that they're there. It's dependent on the physical security, the perimeters, the guards that are present at the bases. Those bases always will have to be able to defend themselves against attack, whether people know that they are there or not. So that's what determines security. And in Pakistan, you've already had uh, uh, attacks against uh, a, a large number of military installations by terrorists uh, over the last many years. And in fact, one of the things we can see on the satellite photos is that over the last five plus years, uh, Pakistan has beefed up the physical security around many of its bases, air bases, uh, army bases, and, and ammunition depots in recognition that there is an increased uh, threat from terrorists against these bases. While I understand what you're saying, but there have been equal concerns about perhaps some of the more fanatic elements also having insiders within uh, Pakistan's army establishment. But moving on, Hans, going by your report, Pakistan may soon reach the size of a full-spectrum deterrent. What are the main features of a full-spectrum deterrent? Well, uh, in terms of what the Pakistani officials have been saying, it is um, a, a broader range of capabilities, ranging from short-range capabilities, uh, sort of intended for battlefield use, if you will, to medium-range uh, systems uh, and, and longer range. But Pakistan is not reaching, uh, you know, as far um, in, in terms of its long-range ballistic missiles as uh, India and other nuclear weapon states are. Um, so they're looking mainly at India and the sort of the immediacy. But, but it is uh, characterized by this distribution of capabilities, so to speak, that can be used at various level of a conflict. So we'll see how far that develops, but right now it consists of short-range missiles, air launch cruise missiles, medium-range ballistic missiles, and also of um, uh, air-delivered bomb, gravity bombs. Um, so it's, it's becoming a very comprehensive uh, a, a deterrent posture. And uh, what remains to be seen, the really interesting part is now how far is Pakistan going to continue to develop this? Uh, I mean, presumably, they're not just going to continue to build up um, just for the sake of it. Um, so at some point, you would imagine to, to see them reach some kind of a level where they say, this is, this is enough for what we need for now. So we will see, we've seen some indications from Pakistan officials that they're 
approaching that point, but we'll see when it happens. All right, that doesn't sound too bad, but your reports, and as you have also in this interview stated, that tactical nuclear-capable launchers do not pose a strategic threat to India, given their short range. What is likely to be their range if, say, they were to be launched from one of the Pakistani nuclear establishments' bases closest to India? Well, if you take the very short-range one, uh, the, the one they call the NASAR, which is a 60-kilometer range um, nuclear-capable rocket launcher, essentially, um, that can't reach very far into India. So it's not a threat, a strategic threat against India. It's something Pakistan uh, intends to use against Indian conventional forces invading Pakistan if that were to happen. So they feel insecurity uh, when it comes to uh, Indian conventional forces as well. Um, other other forces have a, a sort of a medium range of, if you will, if you check the ground launch cruise missile, for example, the Babur, which we are now beginning to see signs are being deployed in the southern part of Pakistan. Um, that system uh, can reach, you know, anywhere from 400 to 700 kilometers, depending who you believe in terms of the range. Um, but that can reach further into uh, India. But it's still not a weapon system that can sort of reach deep into India and threaten the major cities, so to speak. That would have to come from the medium-range ballistic missiles like uh, by, like the Shaheen-2 and, and the Gowrie uh, ballistic missiles. Has your study thus far, I know it's only been days since you've released this report, but has there been any feedback from the defense and nuclear establishment in the United States? No, this is an ongoing debate. So we're putting these things out now, and, and people react to it uh, from time to time. And we'll have a conversation, and it's not the last word. Of course, we continue to monitor this. And later next year, we will put out a report on India's uh, nuclear forces as well. And so we're doing this on all the nuclear weapon states. It's not just Pakistan, of course. So this is something we're trying to keep the public informed about the status of nuclear forces around the world. But Hans, you know, I have to ask you again, and if you could uh, throw more light on, uh, whether it's Afghanistan, India, and many other parts of the world, including America, people are very concerned about the fact that America continues to weaponize uh, Pakistan despite uh, such uh, reports coming to light. Uh, why is that? I mean, shouldn't the United States just stop weaponizing Pakistan? Is it again a war to stop terror or to abet it? <laughs> Well, no, uh, the United States sees Pakistan sort of a, a, as a mixed partner, uh, one where there are really concerns, of course, internally in Pakistan about um, uh, terrorist organizations and the ability or the willingness of the Pakistani government to sort of uh, uh, clamp down on that. Um, recently, we have seen uh, more efforts in the western part of Pakistan to try to do that. Um, but, but the United States also sees a strategic partner to some extent in Pakistan in the fight, in the war on terror. Um, that has been a, an active program over the last 10 years. And so, so there are mixed feelings, if you will. So you, you're not going to get one or the other. You're going to get sort of a, you know, a balancing approach where they're trying to do a little uh, on both sides of it. But of course, it's not just the United States, as we, as we identify in our report. You know, the F-16s, uh, fighter jets, they come from the United States, but the Mirage, they come from France. So mm. they're, and, pa and Pakistan, of course, also gets uh, military equipment from, from China. So there are a lot of nuclear weapon states that, that uh, assist Pakistan at various uh, levels. Hans, you also speak of uh, one of these bases being in Bhavalpur, and Bhavalpur is seen as the hub of uh, uh, terrorists, anti-India terrorists especially, and uh, uh, others of Punjabi Taliban, if I'm uh, 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 to speak of one of the Pakistani journalists, how he refers to Bhavalpur. The fact that one of the bases is there certainly does uh, raise alarm bells in India to a certain extent. Uh, would you say you're confident of the security apparatus that Pakistan's military has created in order to ensure that these uh, systems don't get into the hands of the Islamic, uh, Islamist militants or terrorists, I should say? Right. That's really hard to assess because, you know, we in the public domain no one has real information about what the security is on the ground. Um, what we have to assume, of course, is that when we're talking about the crown jewels of the Pakistani military, namely the nuclear weapons, they are subject to the toughest forms of security. But there's an important detail here. Even though they have uh, nuclear-capable launchers at these bases, that doesn't necessarily mean that the nuclear warheads for those launchers are also physically present at the base on a normal, uh, on a normal day. Um, in fact, what we hear consistently also from U.S. intelligence people is that uh, Pakistani nuclear warheads for these systems are thought 
to be not on the bases themselves, but in central storage facilities and may not even be fully assembled on a day-to-day -day basis. So because we identify these bases, you shouldn't, you shouldn't sort of conclude, therefore, that nuclear warheads are present there and, and, and could fall into the wrong hands. We believe that they are in central storage facilities. Hans, uh, my final question to you, if you could uh, uh, talk a little about how concerned should India be? I know you've spoken on it, uh, but briefly, if you want to tell us if, uh, 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 you know, there is cause for uh, India to be concerned, I believe there is, but how concerned should India be? Well, I mean, both India and Pakistan are concerned about what the other is doing, and so they're monitoring very carefully. And I think one of the specific concerns about the Pakistani-Indian relationship, of course, is that border disputes like we've seen recently can can escalate um, and into a an actual war in a conventional war and once that begins to happen the worry is that it could escalate into potential use or certainly warnings about use of nuclear weapons and so that's as a specific dynamic that is now in play and has been for many years in the Indian Pakistani uh, relationship so I think India should be concerned of course about you know, the broader spectrum of nuclear capabilities in Pakistan, um, if they begin to sort of spill over into actual war fighting scenarios where you can imagine nuclear weapons could be used earlier in a conflict. That is something that I think India should be concerned about, something also that the United States is concerned about. But it's also something that India can try to influence by not appearing too offensively focused with its conventional forces on Pakistan. So there is a very fine balance there that you want to, on the one hand, have capabilities, but on the other hand, you don't want to scare the Pakistanis so much that they begin to develop nuclear-capable force structures that are counterproductive and actually increases insecurity. Hans, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, being there, talking to Vion at quite some length. India has some cause for concern there, but it remains to be seen how the United States and France will react to that very important report by Hans and his colleague. Let's take a short break. We will return with more in just a bit. <laughs>